Okay, so let's start uh, this. Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks for joining us in this fourth meeting of the MAMO webinar cycle Materializing Modernity, Landscape, Architecture, and Anthropology Intersection in 20th Century Rurality. So uh, before starting, for those who are joining the webinar for the first time, let me introduce myself and the context in which this webinar has been organized. I am Federico Pompeiano and I am a researcher at the Institute of Cultural Anthropology and Art Studies in Tirana, where I am developing the research project called MAMO, Materializing Modernity, Socialist and Post-Socialist Rural Legacy in Contemporary Albania which has received funding from the European Union Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Programme under the Marie Curie Action. Um, this webinar uh, cycle has been organized within the framework of the MAMO project, and uh, I would like to thank my host institution, both in Albania and in Italy at the moment, and my supervisor, um, Professor Nebi Bardoshi, uh, Dr. Olsi Lelai, and uh, Professor Nicola Scaldaferri for their support in organizing this event. Um, I am also grateful to the Ethnomusicology and Visual Anthropology Lab and the Department of Cultural and Environmental Heritage at the Università Statale di Milano uh, for providing the means uh, for the implementation of this webinar cycle. Um, I would also like to remind you that the webinar is recorded and that if you do not wish uh, to appear in the video, simply keep your camera off uh, as well as your microphone. And uh, at the end of the presentation, there will be room for comments and questions. Um, today, I have the pleasure, the great pleasure to introduce uh, to you uh, Bosse Lagerpist that will speak about uh, how concepts of integrated conservation might be in roads to sustainable management of cultural landscape. Um, Bosse Lagerqvist is an associate professor at the Department of Conservation of the University of Gothenburg where between 2012 and 2018, he was also the head of the Department of Conservation. Uh, his academic and professional activities have addressed the areas uh, ranging from method for heritage recording uh, over conservation of industrial and maritime heritage as resources uh, for continued societal development into broader concepts of the landscape as the base for human activities and the arena for present and future societal development. Recently, he has been uh, the leader of the uh, Erasmus Plus uh, Partnership on Sustainable Management, Management of Cultural Landscapes uh, with uh, um, 13 partners throughout Europe. And uh, currently he is the University of Gothenburg representative to Uniscape Network, which is a network of experts working on European cultural landscape. And I have also to say that uh, Bosse will be my supervisor during uh, uh, my second segment uh, in, uh, in Sweden uh, next year. And uh, I'm really thanks, uh, thankful for, for this. Uh, but now um, I leave the floor to, to Bosse. So I am going to interrupt the sharing of my screen. And so Bosse. Great, thank you, Ede. It's really nice to be here. And surprisingly, many people have turned up. Uh, and I don't know everyone. I know some, as Nidhi we've spoken with, Anissa we also spoken with. And I also recognize uh, a former student, Ivana, Ivana also. So, and for those I don't uh, recognize now, uh, hello. Still, nice to see you. Uh, I have prepared a presentation uh, based on a number of different issues. Uh, uh, partly because Fede asked me to um, prepare a presentation for a series a webinar series. So uh, I did this, and it's also based on some uh, ideas uh, on how I understand my subject area, conservation, or rather integrated conservation, and also some uh, uh, outcomes of uh, what we have been doing in the Erasmus Plus partnership, and also uh, uh, possible 
future research based on uh, two uh, components or, or outcrops of the Erasmus Plus partnership. Uh, if you have questions <coughs> during my presentation, uh, feel free to um, uh, say something. I, I, this, this way of interacting is kind of the, the normal standard nowadays. We, we have this two-dimensional interface and, and I'm, I'm, I'm more uh, happy with uh, walking around in the lecture room. But still, we, we, we perhaps could have some kind of interaction. So if you have a question, I don't see you. Uh, and uh, uh, so you have, if you have to raise your voice in that case during my presentation, or uh, you could uh, note your questions and we take them afterwards. And I take down the presentation so we can at least see the, the names of you. Uh, so <clears throat> there are, uh, there are, I would say, there are a lot of possible questions to be put on this presentation. So I'm, I'm quite happy with all, all your comments and the critiques uh, of what I will be presenting to you. And uh, Fede, we haven't, I, ha I, I have a, some, some memory of how long time you said I had, but I will continue talk until you break. I, I, I saw that you had, the, the, the outer time limit was 6.30, uh, so it's uh, one and a half hour, but I think we should have some time for discussions, and I don't intend to talk for one and a half hour. I hope I could keep it at like 40 minutes or 45 minutes. That's perfect. Yes, we hope. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so <clears throat> the, 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 the theme that I uh, come up with was then concepts of integrated conservation as inroads to sustainable management of cultural landscapes. And um, uh, what you see here uh, in the background is a former uh, linguine pit in the uh, region of Saxon in former East Germany, bordering on Poland. So you could see some um, uh, ventilation towers in, in the distance. They are on the Polish side. Uh, so this uh, this uh, area, this uh, place where one dug up uh, coal, are going to be uh, transformed into a holiday resort. So you could see that uh, it is planned with a bridge out in the coming lake and some uh, uh, holiday facilities uh, placed on the future shore of this lake that will be filled slowly by groundwater. So it's a, it's a reuse, one could say, of an industrial landscape. Uh, but uh, going into the specifics of my presentation, I want to start with integrated conservation, then I want to go into landscapes, what landscapes of cultural landscape might be, and then we could see where we end up uh, in, in the end. So integrated conservation, well, uh, from my point of view, and I have been uh, working at the university in Gothenburg for a very long time, since mid-1980s, with some periods outside the university in the practice area, uh, in the public uh, administration in Western Sweden, working with uh, heritage. So combining from time to time academic work with uh, professional practice has been really helpful and has influenced me into thinking of, of heritage as an obvious asset for a society's ability to reach uh, sustainable development. So, so I see heritage as an asset and that is a kind of value premise in how I think. And that asset is the obligation of the professional practices to actually work in that direction. So uh, when, I, when I have new students to my department, I say, we, we as a department, we work with material properties. So that is one of the base elements of heritage, the material properties. But the material properties got or received or are addressed with meanings and values uh, and the intangible properties. And that is a consequence of the material stuff being handled and, and uh, 
transformed in uh, the social structures of society. So the interaction between the material and people create a more uh, uh, complex uh, idea of heritage being composed of both material properties and intangible properties. And these properties are then to be handled by former societal bodies and organizations that that is the heritage practice area. And so one could say that through that handling, uh, we have some kind of formal notion of heritage. Uh, so, so that is one perspective of what heritage might be. Integrated conservation has been defined or the area of conservation has been defined by this gentleman in 1986. Uh, his name is Bernard Fielden, he's dead now, but he was, uh, he was the director of ICROM in Rome in the 1970s. And when he came home to the United Kingdom, he was responsible for the restoration conservation of the cathedral in York. And when you do things like that in the UK, you get uh, an, an OBE. So he became Sir Bernard Phelan. And in this uh, conference in 86 in Rome, uh, air pollution and conservation, uh, he defined conservation as the dynamic management of change in order to reduce the rate of decay. So not anything about uh, uh, old stuff or uh, valuable stuff, but rather a, a process of change that need to be managed. And this, this process requires then comprehensive socioeconomic, legal and cultural planning integrated at all levels. So out of this definition that has kind of ruled me uh, since I met Bernard Field and the first time at the end of the 1980s uh, has been really influential in how I understand this, this area. So from the professional practice perspective, I, I would say that the, it's more important with how we work with this process than actual, uh, the, the, the object, heritage as an object. It's more the heritage as a process. And I will come back to that. Uh, so when we look at this process, the heritage process of, of uh, defining what is heritage and what we're going to do with the heritage, uh, I want to uh, present three authors or three uh, groups of people that have in different ways tried to define uh, how we could characterize these process over time uh, and how it differs over time. And the first I want to say something about is Dean Sully. Dean Sully is the man on the left-hand side of this photograph talking to two colleagues of um, mine in my department. And he uh, wrote the chapter in 2013 in one of the volumes of the International Handbooks of Museum Studies. And this chapter was uh, headed Conservation Theory and Practice, Materials, Values, and People in Heritage Conservation. Uh, the second one is Gregory Ashworth that in 2011 presented an article on three, what he defined as paradigms for uh, how built environment has been handled or managed by uh, the professional practice. So he defines these paradigms as the preservation paradigm, the conservation paradigm, and the heritage paradigm. And they are kind of not uh, replacing each other subsequently, but rather uh, overlapping and perhaps is to, to some degree still parallel in, in, in ruling how heritage is operated by, by former public bodies. And the last one is uh, Jörg Jensen and some of his Dutch colleagues uh, that in uh, 2017 presented an article on where they reflected upon how the heritage area uh, were incorporated in spatial planning. So they have an article where they uh, uh, describe this as heritage as a sector, factor, and vector. Sorry for this. So both all these three uh, uh, presenters, all these three authors have defined that the, the processes of working with heritage from the formal uh, public bodies, the formal heritage profession, 
could over time, and we, over time we're talking from like uh, 19th century and onwards, could be divided into three different groups or three different areas of, of activities. And if we put them together and see how they perhaps uh, results in an, in an heritage or uh, describes how the process should be done or what, uh, what uh, drives the process or who participates in the process. Uh, we could do this rather rough um, synthesis of, of these three texts, which I've done rather roughly. Uh, uh, so you have to uh, uh, raise your critique to me rather than to Ashworth or Janssen or Sully. And I have tried to see that uh, in relation to some key concepts, uh, how they differ uh, or how they are have some equal understandings of each uh, paradigm, each uh, perspective, and also some equal understandings of how they differ over time. So if we start with the first one on what is the goal with, with heritage. So we could say we go from a very traditional object-oriented, monument-oriented perspective where we have the true, uh, true history, the true monument, the true material, uh, we don't need to interpret, it's through our expertise, we could lay it bare for the world to find out. Over a process where heritage becomes more of something that contributes to other areas of the society, into a situation where the goal is what kind of narratives, what kind of message could we, we derive from the heritage. Uh, the justification, well, uh, Sally identifies that we have these <coughs> uh, previous charters and conventions that kind of uh, are linked to this, this uh, more traditional understanding of heritage and going over to uh, uh, a situation where heritage is more used as, as uh, something to work with in relation to other areas of society. We have a Buddha charter that focuses on the process and uh, who is responsible for defining the significance of heritage, but also issues raised by what is the authentic heritage, what is authenticity. And over to the fact that what we want to do is to use the heritage and the Convention for Safeguarding the Intangible Cultural Heritage is so focused on the fact that we need to use, we need to train, we need to maintain the knowledge and the skills of intangible heritage. So going from a, a strict keeping, protecting perspectives to a perspective where we are using uh, heritage is something that is reflected on all, all three uh, contributions here. And the focus of course goes from what one thinks is the real, the true monument where the welfare of material heritage has precedence over contemporary needs of people over a perspective where the different stakeholders' needs have a bigger influence of the, the, well, what we are doing with the, with the material properties in the situation where, uh, uh, where, where the, 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 the welfare of the contemporary communities are the most important. Are someone putting a question now? Uh, there is some, some noise in the background. So if, if you have a question, please uh, just uh, shout out or uh, I can continue to talk. Uh, okay, I continue to talk. And the authenticity also going from the object monument oriented material properties, authenticity over where, where the, the authenticity is an outcome of a compromise between different stakeholders into a situation which, where our experience of something is the authentic. So we are uh, moving towards situations where the, 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 the way of understanding heritage is by experiencing different issues such as um, dressing up for, for a medieval play or going in an in a old steam train or steamboat or uh, doing things where we feel the heritage with all our senses. And the last, of course, who are the actors? So we have a kind of top-down expert 
oriented heritage process going over to uh, uh, people up, uh, local community engaged uh, uh, activity. So there's two different directions here where are the important actors. So this, this is how we could see that from the uh, from the 19th century over the 20th century up today, we have different ways of, of paradigms or perspectives of operating professional practices. And you get an indication in the justification of these charters, how this is developing over time. So in the 1960s, 70s, there is an increased uh, interest in using heritage in different, little bit more broader societal context. If we look at these different ways of describing uh, the, the paradigms or the perspectives of, of heritage profession, we could summarize them like this. So if we make a graph of two tensions, so we have one tension between the knowledge-based and the emotionally based. And on the other hand, we have a tension between the individually to the collectively oriented. And in these spaces, we got different needs, different stakeholder interest of heritage. So, and th these different needs, they also kind of describes a historical development of, of heritage. So going back to the 19th century, we have a lot of nation states in Europe that want to express their legitimacy through uh, natural monument, historical monument, providing a kind of alibi for our right to be a nation. And also uh, the, the era of statues of kings, etc., uh, also have this kind of monumental need that heritage should uh, address. Uh, over time, this is the heritage is more and more an arena for academic studies, where we as academics need a heritage as kind of historic reference or evidence that we could could use for our studies, uh, and. This, this, this way of working with heritage, of course, means that we also produce more knowledge about heritage. The, the understanding of heritage becomes more widespread. And in the 1960s, 1970s, when we have, at least in the, in the, in the Western world, we have industrial closures. We are talking about the third industrial revolution when, uh, when uh, industrial production are moving to Southeast Asia or other low, low salary uh, countries, uh, or there's an increased automation in the industry that creates un, uh, unemployment for a lot of people. We have also an increasing urbanization. So we have dramatic transformations in the society that also creates uh, a, a need for something that could create uh, alternative local economies. So we could use heritage perhaps for creating economic, uh, uh, kind of economic uh, development. Also important in this area is the growing uh, tourism industry, the destination industry, perhaps the fastest growing industry during the last 50 years, except the last two years, perhaps due to the pandemic when it has been a total crash for that industry. But the the interaction between the tourism industry and the heritage industry became evident in this, in this part where, where heritage got its instrumental uh, option, its instrumental possibilities. And in that respect, we start to uh, explore heritage on an individual level. So we are living in an, in an increasingly hectic, uh, uh, situation where the, the need for reflection, the need for being uh, able to think uh, on your own life and what is happening and and find some meaning in life, uh, we could see that heritage could fulfill uh, such such needs on the individual basis, while at the same time we address more clearly the the uh, the uh, <clears throat> motivation of local engagement to actually define heritage. So we shouldn't have this top-down process. We should have a bottom-up where the people concerned uh, have their say in what we are uh, creating as, as heritage. And you could say that all these, these different needs of stakeholders contribute to how we form heritage. And of course, we could see this as a 
something that develops over time, over 200 years roughly. But it's also, if we think about it, still uh, in place uh, when we have uh, new heritage in present days. We have some monumental aspirations. There is some ideas about historical reference. There are definite uh, instrumental options somewhere in the background. And if we don't do this with the engagement of the individuals, we are lost somewhat. So, so all these perspectives are in play in some way or another. And if we take these three form, former authors and put them into this system, we could say that their understanding of the more traditional uh, paradigm, the more traditional perspectives of working with heritage, we could put it there. Over time, it's moving over to a more knowledge-based uh, perspective. Uh, in that, it is developed into some understanding of the usability of heritage, the instrumental possibilities of heritage that moves this academic uh, studies, this academic research, research into a broader societal resource for, for developing uh, uh, depopulated areas, for instance. And in this way, heritage also becomes a concern for the individual uh, inhabitants, uh, creating an understanding of heritage as something that actually addresses the, the individual needs for finding meaning, finding position, finding identity in a, 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 a more hectic global uh, society that perhaps uh, someone could feel more alienated from. So this is a way I, I try to understand how the different paradigms and different ideologies uh, rules how heritage is formed and also rules in a way how the heritage profession actually uh, could work with, with heritage. Okay, so we are slowly uh, approaching the landscape. Uh, so if we look at all this, how should we work with this? So from my, my understanding and being in a department that has educated and trained heritage professionals since uh, 1978, and I have been there since, since the nine, uh, mid 1980s, I could understand, okay, we need all these different perspectives. We need to, be able to understand them, but also um, see the difference between them. Of course, we have properties in the landscape that needs to be preserved as monuments. Like for instance, this, this image we have here is of, of uh, a, a facility on uh, Sicily where they produce salt. So you see this, there's sea salts live, uh, lying here that are the result of these ponds. And the water of these ponds are pumped up or pumped, have been historically pumped by these windmills. So the windmill is not, have not uh, an, an operational functionality any longer because this is pumped by, by electric pumps. But for the historical understanding of this place, okay, that windmill or those windmills that are still there are important to preserve. But there are also a lot of skills and, 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 and uh, properties in this landscape that could be adapted for modern needs. We still need salt, so we could still produce salt. And the skills to do this are still in place. So those skills and properties are part of the heritage, but it's also part of a more instrumental approach to work with heritage to create local economies. Uh, and uh, one could, of course, also identify this as an interesting destination for tourism and, and, uh, and uh, visitors. So there is a kind of mini museum in, in this building telling the history of this place. But this is only working with the local engagement, the people still in place here that want to act and work with this. Uh, so we need all these different perspectives and paradigms to cooperate in a creative manner to actually reach good, uh, good outcomes. So we are uh, then landing in the landscape. Um, and what are the landscape? How do we define the landscape? Well, one way is the classical definition by Carl Sauer in 1925. He was professor 
at Berkeley in uh, historical geography, and he, he defined landscape as the cultural landscape is fashioned from a natural landscape by cultural group. Culture is the agent, the natural area, the medium, and the cultural landscape to result. And voila, here we have uh, that typical cultural landscape. This is from mid Sweden, with what you see in the background is a table mountain. So, this is the landscape of table mountains. And this is, of course, the cultural landscape fashioned by uh, a cultural group. So we have an agricultural landscape with a medieval church indicating a long historical uh, 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 place for people who lived here. We have also uh, stone fences that are part of an older agricultural system, but still in place. But we also see rather modern uh, facilities. So this is, a, is not a dead museum landscape. It's a vivid agricultural landscape, but, but with a lot of historical roots. It's a kind of palimpsest with, with, a different, with different properties. So of course, this is what most people, when we talk about cultural landscape, okay, this is what people think of, at least in Sweden, but landscape could also be something else. So the European Landscape Convention defines landscape as an area as perceived by people. So it's not so much the, the idea that landscape should look like something. So this is a cultural landscape. This is how it should look like. This is the model. It's not what the uh, landscape, European Landscape Convention says. It says that the landscape is in the eye of the beholder. It's like uh, what uh, we more and more want to think about heritage, that heritage is more in the eye of the beholder. That is also the way with the landscape. So uh, what the European Landscape Convention says is that we have, we have different types of landscapes. They might be natural, they might be urban or peri-urban or purely rural. They could be land, they could be on inland waters, it could be in marine areas, it could be outstanding landscape with exceptional values, or it could be everyday landscapes, or it could even be degraded landscapes. But the important thing is that it's the local people, the people who are concerned, how they see the landscape, how they perceive the landscape, that is the important. So landscape is also in that respect an important part. So here is a kind of parallel understanding as what we have seen with how the paradigms for heritage professionals have been changed over a period of 200 years. So we have landscape, we have natural landscape, we have cultural landscape. And to understand this, uh, uh, and when I talk to my students, I used to say, okay, we have topography, geology, hydrology in principle, that kind of constitutes the prerequisites for human activities, what, uh, what Kossauer calls the, the natural landscape. And the, the human activities results then in cultural landscapes, agricultural landscapes, and coastal landscapes, maritime landscapes, peri-urban landscapes, urban landscapes, different landscapes. You also have cityscapes, soundscapes, smellscape. I heard one of my students say the other day, the, the smellscape of an industrial area or the smellscape of a cultural landscape where they are focusing on um, breeding pigs, for instance, have a very distinct aroma that we could call, uh, okay, we are entering a smellscape. Uh, but I want to see landscape from a heritage perspective as materialized natural and cultural history. And that natural and cultural history has both uh, material properties and intangible properties. And those properties are under threat not the least defined by the European Landscape Convention. But these threats comes in different shapes and forms. And uh, this is one example. This is the Göta River Valley. So in down below the image in this direction, we have Gothenburg. And up in that direction, we have the big Lake Vänern in the mid Sweden. And this, this is an infrastructure from at least Viking Age and forward. And it's still an important infrastructure for shipping to Vänern. And it's also uh, in total in this valley, it's an important infrastructure. So we have a double railway. We have one highway on this side and we have another highway on that side. And we have industrial areas and we have agricultural areas and we have important historical archeological remains. And we have ideas of uh, new housing areas to so have a lot of different sectors of society have, have interests 
placed in the landscape, which are not totally in communication and dialogue with each other, and often represent also different, uh, what we could call silos in the, the, in the planning of the continued development of the landscape. Uh, another landscape is this, it's outside from where I'm living up here in the Boslen Archipelago, uh, the traditional fishing economy, where the, uh, the soundscape of these hot bulb engines that drives these traditional fishing vessels and creates these traditional fishing communities. So these these images are not that old. It's like um, perhaps uh, 30, 35 years back in time. Of course, you could still see some of these ships, but they are really not there anymore because what is happening with this economy? It has transformed drastically. So what we have today is instead this. We have the fastest growing economy, the two tourism industry that replaces the old fishing community, the fishing economy with the season-based economy of leisure boats. And the fishing vessels do not longer look like traditional fishing vessels. So this is uh, uh, the newest fishing vessels in the Gothenburg region, the Clipperton, and it has more computer power than most university departments have. Uh, it's interesting. It's in total operated by five people and they seldom leave this area. Most of the fishing is managed from here through uh, computer technology. Really a change in an economy that has dramatic consequences of the built environment and the landscape. We have also this landscape, the urban landscape, and some of you recognize this, of course, it's Tirana, where we have a traditional urban landscape of the big city blocks of Tirana, with the small scale buildings inside the blocks and a little bit larger buildings in the, in the border areas of the blocks. And this, when I was in Tirana, this was kind of the very, very strong impression of the structure of the urban landscape of Tirana is this. And of course, this, this landscape is threatened also by, by new constructions that doesn't really speak about Tirana. It's a kind of, anonymous international architectural style that shouts with a very loud voice, I don't give a fuck about you here in the local community. I'm just positioning my feet here, take it or leave it. So this is a way of disrupting and disturbing the, the urban landscape without actually communicating or engaging with the individuals living there. But we have also, of course, the traditional cultural landscape, the agricultural landscape, turning into an increasingly more industrialized landscape. And that industri industrialized landscape, of course, drives on the loss of biodiversity and, of course, drives on also the depopulation of the countryside. And this is a photo uh, a couple of years old. But uh, due to the pandemic, we could see, at least in Sweden, we could see a kind of reverse trend that people want to move out from the urban areas into the countryside. So there is actually a movement in Sweden where people look for desolated house, not perhaps in this uh, desolated status, but still in some way or another, if not habitable, so at least restorable. Uh, and they could uh, yeah, get hold of them rather easily. The owners are quite happy to get rid of them. And they start to restore them and start to live in them and start to have small uh, growing of vegetables, etc. So it's a kind of revival of the so-called green wave in the 1960s and 70s, but with a little bit other influences now, now. Uh, not the least the pandemic situation seems to be something that gets people to think about um, uh, other ways of living rather than in a dense urban environment. So different threats to the landscape and those different threats represent of course by uh, different forces of change like uh, 
technological development or market dynamics or urbanization or whatever that puts pressure on the landscape that results in interventions in the landscape and of course creates impacts on short and long term and eventually leads to a response uh, and so that is kind of a normal routine for where, where uh, both uh, cultural heritage but also natural heritage kind of come in as, as a response to already taken decisions and activities so it's a kind of uh, not so proactive uh, in uh, integration within those factors of change so if we look at the landscape as materialized natural and cultural history with uh, material and uh, intangible properties we, we perhaps need to look at this as a kind of whole we need to understand the full perspective the holistic perspective of not only the the impacts but also what what is driving the impacts could we actually work with other kinds of uh, driving forces for change. So going back to Sir Bernard Phelan and his definition of <clears throat> uh, conservation, we, we of course need to perhaps look at these driving uh, forces of change as decay. So if we look at them as decay, you remember uh, he said conservation may be defined as a dynamic management of change in order to reduce the rate of decay. Okay, so decay, he says, is external causes like climate, biological issues, natural disasters, etc. If we live in a house, we could have neglect or, or something leading to humidity or so, leading to decay internally. But what he focuses on is the man made causes of decay. So we have neglect, we have wars, we have purposeful alterations, we have politics or even lack of politics, environmental pollution, fashion bureaucratic processes, economic interest, vandalism, theft, and perhaps the most important of them all, stupidity. The stupidity is perhaps the biggest reason why we have problems. So these are the ways, these are the factors we need to work with in an integrated conservation approach to, to provide a better sustainable societal development. Our problem is there is too much silo planning when it comes to urban planning, land use planning, overall the strategic decisions taken for, for the continuing development. So heritage is not uh, best in class here. We could say that heritage has its shortcoming. So one of the shortcomings, which is the problem with heritage is that we could see heritage professions as divided into different boxes. And these boxes are embedded in each other and they are marked by differences in educational backgrounds, in professional practices, in legislative frameworks, in public fundings, and in a lot of different uh, ways that actually make them different from each other. And where decisions in one box could have negative impact in another box. Like in Sweden, for instance, we have now conflicts between natural landscape people on one side and building another special structure people on the other side. Uh, in the consequences of implementing the European Water Directive, and I will not go into uh, deeper into that, but we have severe conflicts in that. All these uh, boxes are subject for what the society at large thinks about overarching themes like circular economy, the need for the recycling, stewardship, preservation, all these good words we want to find and, and uh, work with. And of course, I, I could see from the 1980s and onwards, this is something that has been growing stronger and stronger in society. So it's more clear now we have the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals and we talk more about this because these these things I am convinced of are affected by the social cultural processes. So the more we as heritage professionals could get the social cultural processes to actually adopt issues like this, we get the politicians, the decision makers to most, uh, talk and act more strongly in this respect. And then we perhaps could get rid of uh, these different boxes because if we integrate these boxes into a more coherent whole we get possibly a better resilient uh, uh, capability of society but 
this will also lead to a more complex heritage dynamics because more the more we integrate these different boxes the more complex the heritage processes will be so the integrated conservation is always constantly performed in the realms of more complex heritage dynamics so this is this is the challenge we need to do something here so what should we replace that with? Well, we should replace it with something that engages people, something that could be place specific. That's something that actually is meaningful. And uh, I think that the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals, they are meaningful. And if we look at them, not as 17 different goals, but 17 small portions of a totality, and we work with the totality, well, then we perhaps might be on the road to actually make heritage, natural and cultural, as a productive, creative resource for sustainable society development. Because if we closely look on these different goals, we could find possibilities to address heritage issues in all 17 goals. Okay, this is not something we could just start with. We have some research needs. So we have the first important research need is that we need to develop models and routines for the society to get a higher degree of ability to actually work with this kind of complex uh, ways of uh, using heritage as a resource for, for a sustainable uh, societal development. This requires interdisciplinary approaches. And by using this idea of integrated conservation linked to notions of ecosystem services in all its varieties and how we assess and uh, work with with uh, landscape character assessments might provide meaningful ways to actually produce these models and routines and i will come back to that in in a short while uh, i'm not really running out of time but i will try to uh, speed up a little so i think that, and that's my point of view is that we could do this with an uh, integrated conservation research approach. Uh, why, does, why is that? Because, well, integrated conservation research is, has some characteristics which, is actually, which are meaningful in this perspective. It's practice-led, meaning that uh, it's not like anthropology, that we study what they are doing in the heritage area, and then we write a report and say, this is what they did in the heritage area. They are crazy. Integrated conservation research is practice led, meaning it is performed in the practice. So practice is the natural arena and the methods of practice are the methods of inquiry. So that is practice led research. It's cross disciplinary by nature, but it's also practice oriented, meaning that it's not only a question of landing your research result in a report for publication in a peer reviewed journal somewhere, but also the fact that your research should be possible for you to execute. You should be able to actually operate your research results in a model and routine that actually helps the society to reach a sustainable development. So the closeness to practice is fundamental for this research. So uh, now we're starting to approach uh, the final slides of, of my presentation where I have some, uh, uh, we have this idea of the continued research, how we should actually operate that. So following the, the three authoritative uh, authors of how one could perceive the paradigms and perspectives of how heritage professions have uh, developed their practices over time, we could say, okay, heritage is a process. So what is that process? Well, that process is how we organize and perform decisions on, uh, on heritage. So we could, from a system theory perspective, we could talk about the decision rationals. So that is one part of the research outcome. We need to define and set into a system the decision rationals for how decisions are taken in order to reach sustainable development. Those decisions are uh, uh, based on what we should do with the outcome. Uh, which is the other part of heritage, the objects, the outcome of our activity, and that is the subject matter. So we have decision rationals that should take care of the subject matter in such a way that we have a, a, a sustainable societal development. 
that's easy. Yes. So I have a tentative model based on the outcome of the Erasmus Plus Partnership on Sustainable Management of Cultural Landscapes. And two partners that was not partners in the development but became associate partners during that project was the Balaton Eco Museum on one hand and the Landscape Observatory of Estreyatelan on the other hand. So the Balaton Eco Museum is is under establishment around the Lake Balaton in Hungary, one of the big lakes in Europe. And the Landscape Observatory of Jutland is uh, following the European Landscape Convention, situated here in West Sweden. And I have a former role in the Landscape Observatory and an informal role in the Eco Museum. The Eco Museum represents the subject matter, how to work with the content and outcome orientation, while the Landscape Observatory works with how we should process and make good decisions, the decision rationals. So these two perspectives are case studies in uh, the coming research where they represent different issues. So the Landscape Observatory is a case study in what kind of decision rationals do we need to work with? And the Balaton Eco Museum is a case study on how do we engage people so we have this broad variety and not a kind of uniform, but rather complex understanding of narratives and, and histories and places and spaces that are the, the, the uh, core content of the Eco Museum concept. So from these two case studies, uh, the ambition is to develop models. So we, from the Eco Museum case study, we will have models that we could see, could we implement them in the landscape of territory of Westerjutland for increasing uh, the ability to formulate decision rationals. And from the landscape of territory case study, we could create case study, uh, create models for decision rationals for a complex landscape with a lot of stakeholders, how we could integrate them, them into uh, uh, joint decisions in strategic decisions on, on the future of the landscape. So that is, that is the, the, the uh, ambition of, of the research. So to conclude, uh, we could see, say then that uh, through the Landscape Observatory, we could uh, understand integrated conservation as a governance structure, a governance structure for how to manage the complexity of heritage, uh, uh, landscape development, uh, uh, sustainable development, economic development. So we have a governance structure that are represented by integrated conservation through the landscape observatory model. That governance structure enables uh, 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 an ethos of stewardship that actually addresses and talks and engage the people on the ground, the eco museum concept uh, that makes uh, people engaged not only in heritage, but in the landscape and in the future development of the landscape. And through this combination, we could actually formulate uh, grounded, transparent managerial routines for actually controlling the processes that needs to be controlled in order to actually reach in the end uh, a, a good democratic, uh, transparent uh, development of the landscape where heritage is considered uh, a valuable resource and not a side issue that could be treated through specific legislation. Okay, thank you. That was my presentation, five minutes to six. Uh, I hope you're still awake. Yes, we are awake and it was really super. Thank you very much, Bosse, for your interesting uh, contribution. Um, I would like to just uh, make a comment because uh, uh, your contribution just uh, recalled me a speech made by Salvatore Settis, which is an Italian uh, archaeologist and art historian. And uh, that, uh, I mean, he, uh, in occasion of a prize uh, received uh, in 2011 for the publication of his book, uh, which uh, um, the title translated in English is Landscape, Constitution, Cement, Fighting for the Environment Against the Civil um, Decay. He said that uh, um, 
we should be able to think and address landscape and the need of landscape as a common heritage, not in a mere aesthetic sense, but also, and now I would like to quote Setis, um, in a philosophical sense, since landscape deals with nature, in a historical sense, because it deals with collective memory, in an ethical way, since it has to do with human behavior, in a societal way, since landscape refers to the idea of community, and in a political way, because it has to do with the concept of citizenship. Yeah. And this is understandable, <laughs> since the landscape is the most uh, faithful mirror of the society that um, produce it. And uh, at the same time, it is, uh, this is also what emerges uh, uh, from the 2000 European Landscape uh, uh, Convention, where the definition of, of landscape clearly stated the same. And so, yeah, this was just a little comment uh, to your uh, presentation. Thank you. And uh, I would like to pass the word to Olsi uh, Leilai. Please, Olsi. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. First and foremost, I would like to thank Professor Langerwitz for uh, his uh, lecture. And uh, on the behalf of the Institute of Cultural Anthropology and Art Studies, we are very pleased to have this possibility to communicate for the second time vi virtually, yes. but hoping that the, the third one, it will be a more like human. Uh, yes, I human really format, look forward you know, to that. <laughs> so we can uh, eventually uh, skip this, uh, this uh, 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 visual and, uh, uh, and webinar uh, yeah. representation. So, and, and uh, eventually, in, in your lecture, like you, you, you address a number of points which are very crucial in understanding both the, the heritage as a concept and eventually also the processes involved in it, in giving it form and shape. And uh, also, uh, it, it also provides us uh, rooms for thought eventually in the way how the, a number of agents that are taking part in it, in shaping and giving form to not only to the materiality of the landscape as an existence, but also to its understanding as a process, on the other hand, where, where forces within society as a, uh, do collide and produce a, a sense of our understanding of what, what landscape is. And within this, uh, the, the agencies that are taking part, you, you also underline the number of actors where eventually so sometimes these actors do have conflicting perspectives on uh, what landscape is and what conservation is. Yeah. And these uh, conflicting perspectives also are conflicting power relationships, like with different interests behind it. Like, and um, uh, but so somehow, like uh, they e even the way how within this uh, very idea of integrated mode uh, uh, becomes very difficult in practice to articulate this sense of democratic, democratic uh, uh, ap application where all these agents are, are are participating, especially when the very sense of conservation and 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 the heritage are it's uh, uh, articulated within the very notion of modernity. Uh, and progress, and uh, as you underlined, uh, also nation states, uh, a sense of identity, a shared of identity, but also on one hand, we have identity uh, as a concept being produced by narratives of, of uh, around objects and spaces. But on the other hand, we have this uh, other sense of uh, modernization that society go through. And, uh, and uh, in, a, in a moment, this uh, aspect of modernization produced a sense of what a, a landscape becomes and have to become. And you also took the, the, the case of Tirana as an example of uh, how, how conflicting ideologies are colliding in it. Hmm. So uh, my, my question is precisely, uh, uh, where the academic community is invited, especially when conservists, uh, uh, there is one thing when we have the auditorium, and on the other hand, like is when we go from the uh, the the auditorium, we go to to the field, and where the anthropologists try to understand your craziness. <laughs> yeah. in a way. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I, I wouldn't have framed. I mean, it wouldn't be framed in that way. Like we, we 
so so but my question is precisely this like uh, between uh, the, the the theory and application mm. where the the com conservation uh, the conservationist or, or uh, the lecture the uh, the profession is the, uh, the 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 academic stands in, in between mm. especially in making sense of this like uh, conflicting uh, 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 aspects of the landscape especially when we know that the hitter uh, the uh, the uh, conservation heritage and uh, heritization of a space mm. and, and the politics of memory mm. uh, are, are framed with this touristification of spaces mm. and, and and trying and of this enactment of, of oneself uh, as, as an identity mm. and, and the making sense of uh, of a space as a you know, economic opportunity so uh, this is a, a comment and also a question like uh, yeah. Between the the gap, how this gap is being narrowed, yes. especially when we try to produce this idea of democratic involvement, where yes. it somehow to me it's, it seems like a, 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 a kind of a drawing back, and the responsibility is shared, but nobody takes also responsibility of. Uh, yeah, so. yeah, you are you are you are putting the fingers on on a crucial point, I think, uh, because. Uh, as soon as my, my experience uh, from from working in academia for, for several decades and also having a number of, of years in the practice is that when 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 we are addressing heritage issues in the society, uh, there is in general an immediate focus on the end result. Uh, it's uh, how how should the house be restored? Uh, should that bridge be preserved or that bridge? Uh, should we have this kind of monument or that kind of monument? Or is this urban block preserved and we are only allowed to have that kind of color or not that? So it's it's what the focus is on the end result. Uh, so so uh, I I I want to have a change where perhaps you don't actually reach the end result. You, you, have, you, are, you are perhaps in a kind of continuing process of uh, balancing uh, different properties in different situations because otherwise you, you kind of end up and that, that is, I mean, that is one problem with, with heritage. We, we have monuments from dating 60 years back, we have monuments dating 40 years back, we have monuments dating 30 years back, and they are, they are the consequence of that time. But today perhaps we have another, uh, we have other needs, we have other ideas about what is heritage. We, have, we, have, we are more aware of the differences between history and memory, and the differences between history, memory and heritage. Uh, while uh, when they created some heritage some time ago, they perhaps didn't discriminate between history and heritage, but thought that the heritage represents the history. Uh, but uh, during the, the, I mean, what we have seen the last year in Black Lives Matter, for instance, or uh, Me Too movement, we could see that former national heroes, former statues has been turned into symbols of oppression and anti-democratic movement. So there is, there is always a problem when one has defined a heritage, regardless if it's, uh, as uh, Alice Regan says, uh, regardless if it's an intentional monument or a monument out of the uh, H values or historical values, when it's, when it's defined in its heritage form and its shape, it has a time limit it has a best before date uh, and and we, we 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 could see that more or less dramatically with the black lives matter consequences but we will also see it in in terms of for instance old uh, uh, we can see in sweden for instance we have uh, buildings that are listed according to the heritage act and the, the listing could have been taking place for like 30 years ago Today, there's a, a big need that, oh, why are they listed? Because we really need to do some changes here and we are not allowed to do it. So the listed building is not the resource anymore. It's just the problem 
It is a problem that costs money and it doesn't tell anything, it doesn't contribute with anything, and we don't really understand why it's listed. So, so the, 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 the problem with producing a heritage is that as soon as it is produced, it is something that has a specific time, uh, time limit, as long as it is not, I mean, they could have very long time limit or could have a certain time limit, but it's still, it will reach a time when we have to question it. Uh, like for instance, uh, we, we have one big national monument in Sweden, and that is the 17th century ship Vasa, which is in a museum in Stockholm. They lifted it up from the sea bottom in the 1960s, early 1960s, and put it into a museum. Okay, very good, a natural monument. Uh, it's actually a monument over failure and incompetence because it sank due to incompetence and the failure to construct the ship. But still, it's a, it's a huge attractive, uh, uh, it's attractive for a lot of tourists that it's kind of symbol and it's uh, really something that, uh, takes a lot of resources to be preserved. And, and the, the, the crucial issue is that it has a time limit because it's slowly sinking, because it's, it's, it's built for floating on the sea and not standing on land. On land. So when it stands on land, it, due to the gravity, the gravity, it collapses slowly. So, in the end, you could say that, well, should we let it collapse or should we try to contract it? And if we should contract it, we need to replace original parts with new parts. So then you are in the process of changing that ship into a replica of the original ship. And then you are into some, some kind of strange process where you actually have left the original idea of, of the heritage. Perhaps you should do it in another way. Nowadays, you never lift that kind of wreck up from the sea bottom because you only create problem. So, so one doesn't do that. Uh, but we still do other things. We dig up archaeological remains. We uh, uh, list buildings. We protect without taking into consideration that could this be really protected for eternity? Or is it a time limit? Or should we use it in another way? Could we actually, if we want to have this as an asset in societal development, in what way could we use that heritage then as an asset? Probably not as a protected piece alienated from the societal development, but rather something that takes part in the societal development and are used in the societal development. And in that respect, one could say, Okay, then it's necessary to identify what kind of qualities and properties do we need to build on? Do we need to maintain? Do we need to see to that these lives on? But they could be added with other issues, other topics, and given an added value and contribute to the society and engage people in society. So, so I mean, the. Uh, when, when we talk about memory and, and uh, the politics of memory and the social memory, all people have a certain memory of something. But the problem when you're doing in heritage is that you monopolize the memory into one interpretation, uh, which could be an easy way of exclude group, big groups of people uh, and an easy way of actually indicating who who of us are really the important people because it's our collective memory that we are uh, producing into a monument like this. So, so uh, I, I would say it's not, it's not easy and it's not, it's not so that the academics have been in the forefront of creating new ways of working with heritage. Rather the opposite, I would say. The academics have been the ones who have kind of uh, uh, part of the problem, I would say, uh, and and I could see. I I, I will not. I, I said something about anthropology studying what the conservatives are doing. <clears throat> it's not a critique, but it's it's a kind of difference uh, when 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 are working in an academic department where we train. We started our uh, background by training heritage professionals, and we did that for. Um, 
14, 15 years before we started a PhD program. And then we started to train researchers in the same kind of practices that we trained our students. And they produced doctoral dissertations and started research projects still with a mental image that the research would take place in the practice. And that is, that is a major difference from more traditional academic subjects like anthropology or ethnology or uh, cultural history, that one, one has its uh, subject matters, historical uh, traditions from the academic viewpoint, how one studies something. We didn't have any history in the academic. We, we were the result of identified needs in the professional practice. And due to some circumstances that were more or less randomly in place in Gothenburg at the end of the 1970s, it was possible to start that kind of training. But it's important to note that the first 10 years of the department's history, we were in constant conflict with the National Heritage Board. We were in constant conflict with all kinds of heritage professional bodies. We were in constant conflict with the other academic subject areas because no one understood what we were doing because we were, we were causing trouble in the practice because our students enter the practice with this new idea that heritage is something we should work with in the societal development. It's not something that needs to be protected. It's not something that we need to use and work with. And that, that, that resulted in constraints and stress in the heritage field. And I still remember in 1986, I had just started my, my position at the, the department and a representative from the National Heritage Board called me on the phone and he was on the top of his lungs shouting in the phone for half an hour that we should stop do what we did. Uh, so that was the general <clears throat> uh, attitude towards us. So that is why I, I kind of um, yeah, are a little bit hesitant in, in terms of the heritage area focusing always on constructing the end product without perhaps bothering about the process in construction. Perhaps we should focus on the process and that is the, 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 the valuable contribution to the societal work rather than uh, the outcome, there will be an outcome eventually, but that outcome is often uh, the result of a broader spectrum of people uh, willing to take part in deciding what that outcome might be. So it's not a quite uh, a, a stringent answer on your questions, it's more like, yes, these are issues that needs to be discussed and investigated and studied because it's, it's not easy to, to find simple answers, uh, but, but, I, but I distinctly think that the, the, the development that is described by, by Dean Sully or Greg Ashworth or Jörg Jensen, it's, it's, it's a good background to understand our journey, regardless if we are heritage professionals or heritage academics, but we, we are part of a journey. We are part of that tradition where we have started somewhere uh, with the idea of the monument, the true historical monument, to a situation where we understand, okay, we need to address people. We need to have their engagement. We need to, if we don't have their engagement, uh, it's kind of pointless. So, so, uh, so, so that, that is something we are part of. And I think that third, third column of characteristics of the paradigms of perspectives is not the end, but it will continue. We will, in 20 years, we will look back and say, okay, what came after that was this. And perhaps we are in the starting point of that, where we actually understand that we, we need to combine all these different pro, uh, approaches into something that are actually functioning 
in the societal context. Because we have still, we have still a need of monuments. We have still a need of the authenticity, the, the uh, drama of something that is really, really old and, and the, the, the excitement of that. But we still also have the need of the, I, the feeling of meaning, identity, uh, a sense of direction in the present society and that, that we are recognized, we are seen, we could say something and we are heard. So that is also, so we need to combine these uh, endpoints in something. There's a raised hand. Yes, it's Lerina. Lerina, yeah. please. Yes. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you, Professor Agervist, for your presentation. Um, I have a question uh, concerning, I, mean, I am a member of the uh, Department of, Ado of Ethnology at the Institute of uh, Cultural Anthropology and Art Studies. And uh, my question is on the, on, on what I understood is your concept of landscape you are using. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I had the impression that um, the way you, you use the concept landscape, even if it can be um, a tool or a critical tool, tool towards uh, heritage policies in modernities, it still remains quite a modern concept. And I'm not against that, but my, I have a question if an, if an heritage professional encounters a community which has a quite different or radical concept of landscape, mm. like, like a shattered one. Uh, for example, I'm referring to a generation of, um, of anthropologists in, in the continent, but even across the Atlantics who are intensively working on different notions of landscape where uh, what we see as materialized social or historical process, it's still a modern one, but it does not respond to what these communities call a quite spiritualized materiality. Oh, so yeah. in this case, when you are in front of such a shattered concept of landscape, oh. how does it affect your studies and also your methodologies and practices in the heritage? Or yeah, uh, yeah, yeah you, you, you are quite right. Uh, that, that, that is why we, or, or I want to have this, research with the two case studies of the Balaton Echo Museum on one hand and the, the Landscape Observatory on the other hand, because the, 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 the Landscape Observatory, as you, you, you imply perhaps, is that, the, that there we have absolutely a kind of modern understanding of landscape, a modern landscape uh, uh, perspective, uh, where we I would say we don't discriminate between cultural landscape or natural landscape uh, or urban landscape, but we talk about landscape in the landscape observatory context. Uh, since our ability to address the landscape means that regardless which landscape we address, it's a kind of cultural consequence in our addressing the landscape. So in that respect, you could say all landscapes are cultural in, in a way or another. But, uh, but this, uh, this issue of races is something that is also uh, more relevant in, in, in the case of the Echo Museum, uh, where, where, where uh, the Echo Museum concept is perhaps not an, uh, an um, easy to grasp concept uh, as well. It's like uh, the problems with landscape perhaps, but so there is something when I discussed for, for some decades, what, what is an eco-museum? And of course, there are examples of eco-museums, but if you're going to start an eco-museum today, what, where are you heading and um, what are you working with? And there are two key concepts, I think, when it comes to eco-museums uh, that have some succession uh, in a way you could say. So, so if you go back 10 years or so, one talks a lot about uh, eco museums as, as, as something that have its focus on place. Uh, the place in the sense that it's a place where, where people uh, and the history historical roots are meeting with present day, sort of. It's, it's kind of uh, too short to describe, but that has been 
uh, replaced or, or embraced uh, more and more but, uh, but by the, the concept of space. And I think that the space concept is what you are, are um, perhaps talking about because the space concept in terms of the Eco Museum is not, is also incorporating, uh, for instance, the spirituality of landscapes. Uh, uh, so, so by combining space and place in the Eco Museum concept, uh, I think one could address the understanding of what landscape might be in terms of content or subject matter. Uh, I will not say that it could grasp everything, but the principles of it is that it should be a kind of bottom-up processes where you could uh, identify all these different, perhaps contradictory uh, perspectives of understanding the landscape through uh, uh, place and space. I don't know if that was uh, an answer, but I, 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 uh, I, I am not too normative in my under perhaps it was uh, reflected that I was kind of normative in my understanding of what, what conservation and landscape uh, how they should be defined but I'm, I'm not really that but I, I understand the the complexity of both heritage but definitely so the complexity in terms of the landscape uh, and it specifically the, the different kinds of landscape when we talk about how people are engaged or localized or, or rooted in the landscape, how they might have the different understandings of the landscape. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I was checking the chat, but there are no <laughs> questions in the chat. For you, Bosse, I don't know if there, you, there is someone else that wants or wish to intervene or ask something to the professor. Seems no one. <laughs> Let's see. No. Okay. In that case, I have to thank you for your uh, interest and that you have uh, you have stayed uh, and listened and uh, uh, I, I don't know every one of you I know some of you uh, and I hope uh, I hope that uh, I will be I, I've, I have a special relation with with the CHWB offices in the Western Balkans and specifically the one in Tirana. And I have a special uh, soft heart for Tirana. <laughs> so, so I, and of course also Eurocastra. So I, I, I look forward to come back as soon as uh, this uh, strange situation we are into um, loosens its grips on us. Uh, so that is something I think we all could look forward to, that we actually could travel and meet and uh, have uh, creative meetings. Uh, and I think uh, that is something definitely would be uh, something we could grow out of uh, FEDES project. Uh, eventually it will be finalized and we have to think, Federica, how, how we should continue your 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 route towards professorship. <laughs> yes, my slowly route to professorship. Yeah. yeah. Next next research project. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, uh, I want to thank uh, all um, our participants and uh, a big thanks to you, Bosse, for contributing in this uh, webinar. I would like to um, remind to all of you that next week uh, there will be the last meeting of the MAMO webinar cycle. And um, we will have uh, um, Dumitro Ruzo, which is uh, the president of Baku Association in Romania. And um, he is also uh, among the ones that uh, started the um, initiative Socialist Modernism. 
So uh, he will uh, talk about uh, this initiative and uh, how to take part in this uh, mapping of uh, socialist uh, architecture throughout Europe. And so I hope you will join us uh, for uh, our last meeting next week. Uh, thank you to everyone and have a nice evening. Thank you. Bye. Bye.